I think it was 98, Ben Shaw came up with this guy, I can't remember, his name. Hubbard was his name, ironically, who was really one of the few people in the world whose real specialty was dehydration. And um, he had gone and saw the autopsy photos um, for the first time, and he said, look, these are horrendous, but he says, I will tell you one thing, she's not dehydrated. And, we were like, and this was in 98, right, after, right about the time of the indictment. And, um, and so, you know, we were like, whoa, this is a huge break. Um, this is important. And this is when Miscavige came down for the indictment problem, myself and Rinder. And we worked tightly with Ben, and we started hiring all these people, Bodden, um, What's the other guy's name? Wecht. You know, these guys who who are the big celebrity uh, medical examiners. You know, they they were just the big name guys. We had, you know, sub guys from every discipline and sub-discipline. I mean, we had a huge army of medical examiners. Um, Just like the Church of Scientology has bolstered the private investigator economy in certain regions of the country at different times, we bolstered the medical examiner consultant industry for two or three years there between 98 and 2000. But um, Miscavige and I saw the state attorney's office on a number of occasions through 1999 because we were, we were, we, we then retained Hubbard and then we retained all sorts of people that were, you know, an, a, analyzers of different sub things to back up what he was saying. And um, we're trying to make a case to Doug Crow, who was the prosecutor and um, the state attorney, which was Bernie McCabe. And we had a number of meetings, you know, and I would haul in all the science and we'd have it all displayed and broken down and DM would do the presentations. And um, Lee Fugate was the one that came with us because he was the guy. Lee Fugate is the guy, is the door opener down there. Lee Fugate, if you ever met him and you weren't opposed to him, you'd think he's the friendliest guy the best good old boy you'd ever want to meet. Really a very pleasant guy to be around. And so that's what he does. He can't litigate worth a spit. He doesn't know the law from second base. But he knows everybody because he's a hail fellow well met. Okay, And he was in the state attorney's office in the 70s. Knows most of the judges in Pinellas County. Um, knows all the people in the state attorney's office. The whole deal. So Lee was that, was he was there for. He was with Weinberg in... Uh, the Spader-Zuckerman firm out of Tampa. He was working with them. But he was the guy. Sandy Weinberg was going to court, but Lee was the guy who was doing all the, really working with Miscavige a lot because he was going to open doors for Miscavige to, you know, deal directly. Okay, and we went, we went to the state attorney's office on a number of occasions in 99 trying to get them to drop the charges on the basis of these scientific findings. And it was pretty clear Doug Crow wasn't here and buying any of it. Bernie McCabe was mildly interested, but Doug Crow was really the brains and the effort in that office. He was the guy who did all the heavy lifting. So Lee came up with this idea. He says, you know, I saw Joan Wood's attorney, Jeffrey Goodis, who's out of St. Petersburg, her personal civil attorney. And I met him, you know, because that's his thing. And DM just is like, hey, come on, Lee, what are you doing? And then, because whenever Lee is talking about, you know, I've been hobnobbing with Judge Schaefer or her clerk, and her, she said blah, and he's like, he, you know, he wants to hear, that's when he wants to be in. He says, does Lee hear anything? Lee hears something, Lee's coming over. He drops everything and goes down and sees Lee with me and Mike, and Lee debriefs on running into Schaefer. And he'll sit there and talk about the rest of the day reading tea leaves into, he, you know, he makes some comment and she makes some, and it's just one of these sort of Southern things where he's making a joke and she, and they were trying to read, you know, like maybe she doesn't buy into their bullshit, you know. Anyway, I'm telling you, this is what was going on between in that year when Miscavige was down there obsessing with this case. But um, we were putting together this presentation with all these experts and we were bringing experts to the state attorney's office the whole nine And it wasn't going to happen. So I think it was late 99, Lee comes up with this other idea. He's met Jeffrey Goodis. And so this guy was like, yeah, well, what's the deal? He says, well, you know, I just said hi, but whatever. He says, you know, but uh, 
So there was this whole thing, Lee, you got to get me a meeting with Jeffrey Goodis, which he does, okay? And Miscavige does this whole meeting and does this hour-long presentation um, talking about how Joan Wood screwed it up so bad and we really have her best interest at heart because she's going to really eat it in this case and be discredited and may end up getting sued because... Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Okay. And the reason I'm saying, you know, you're not going to, you know, this, it, it's a two-side story because there was a lot of science. We had this science. We didn't make this stuff up. There was these people that were testing that the Hubbard finding on the dehydration was actually correct. Okay. And we got into the most meticulous game of, I mean, Miscavige did a whole number with this guy, um, impressing him on a, bonding with him on a personal level. You know, got his interest at first, really appealed to, I'm this guy that kind of, his own narrative he kind of explained, and I'm this guy that, you know, took over this church from Hubbard, and I've been under assault ever since, and here's the St. Pete Times profile they did on me, and, you know, I'm an important guy, and I hobnob with John Travolta and Tom Cruise, and, you know, ba ba da ba da and, you know, to a guy in St. Petersburg is kind of impressive, and he was impressed. In any event, um, he agreed to have another meeting to study more of this stuff. You know, we had several meetings with him. Dave Miscavige and I, in particular, Lee didn't even come to these meetings. You know, the thing was very carefully done so that Lee wouldn't know what went down between Miscavige and Goodis. I think one of the reasons I was even there was to serve as a witness for Miscavige in the event. You, you get what I mean? Because he wouldn't even let Lee come to these meetings. I'm an attorney because it was so hush hush and we had to be so quiet. Um, I was there for a, another purpose, which was I always was his right hand man when it came to presentations, and I always had the data all in perfect order and I could flip out anything at the, and I had the fact and the answer to anything that might come up and I had the backing for every part of his presentation. If the guy ever hesitated, he'd go, he'd look at me and I'd pull out the file and he'd have the document. You know what I'm saying? It was pretty, it was actually pretty effective. I mean, we did it with the IRS many times. We did that with Jeff Goodis. But Miscavige really established this sort of personal line with him to the point where it was almost like Goodis was representing like Miscavige they become pals like Goodis was into um, he would always comment on Dave's cufflinks because Dave always wore cufflinks and they were very snazzy cufflinks like one he had a set that were White House cufflinks I think he got from Bob Gray um he had, uh, you know, he had diamond ones, you know, he had platinum ones, he had all these very intricate, I mean, you know, a lot of them. And, and Goodis was always commenting, hey, let me see what you're, you know, and so, I don't know, a month into it, now we're wanting to get a little closer, Dave has a custom-made set of, you know, several hundred dollar cufflinks made and has them delivered to, and the guy's blown away because I see him, he's wearing them the next time, like, hey, 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 you know what I'm saying? Um, always brings up Travolta, like in a giddy way, like, you know, he, his wife and him think Travolta is God, right? So we had one of those events coming up, because we started doing those events, and the whole intent was to influence the judiciary, influence the opinion leaders, but most specifically the judiciary. We were holding those um, Galen uh, events like every few months, at the Fort Harrison, we'd invite all the local judges and opinion leaders, and then we'd have all these celebrities intermingle with them. Well, when the next one came up, Jeffrey and his wife got special seating at the play. They had their own special table, and then Travolta came over as if you know, Dave wanted me to say hi and tell me he's really, um, really said you're a great man, and so I'm really honored to meet you and your wife. You know, the photo, the personal photo, the whole thing. Tampa Bay goes to the Super Bowl. Tom DeVocht, if you can ever get a hold of him, will confirm this for you. Um, 
he's working, I think we were working with Holland and Knight, one of the big white shoe firms in Tampa on real estate. And Tom was the contact. Tom got primo Super Bowl tickets. The Super Bowl was in San Diego that year, as you might recall. So Dave presents Jeffrey with 50 yard line, 20 row up, primo seats at the Super Bowl. And, I, and Tom would have to confirm this, but I seem to recall that Travolta was right around in that same area and we arranged for him to go bump into them. Okay? I mean, this is the kind of stuff. I mean, he was careful. Mark, DM, carefully micromanaged and organized these things. The guy can be extremely manipulative and extremely char charming in the way he's doing it as if it's natural. See, I'm seeing all this is all rolling out, but I'm also seeing how Jeff, Jeffrey Goodis just thinks this is just naturally sort of, you know what I'm saying? By the end of it, Jeffrey Goodis is talking to Dave Miscavige, like Joan Wood. Um, Dave's like telling him what he needs to get her to understand, you know? And they basically get it to the point where she's freaked. Okay. Well, what would let me tell you, let, let, here's some of the things that we're getting from Goodis. Like, who does she really, who are her real opinion leaders when it comes to spectroanalysis? This is a sort of a specialty of analysis of fluids or vitreous fluids, right? Well, it's this guy, I can't remember his name, but he's this really wild, um, mad professor from New York. And in fact, Leif Ugate and I flew to New York during over Christmas. I will never forget that. And met with Baden, Wecht, and him in this unbelievable thing. It was like something out of a Sherlock's home movie. You know, he's down in this place on the east side, and there's like, you know, books that go all the way up 20 feet, and they're all, it's completely dirty. I mean, but this guy was, a, but she thought this guy was it. So we sought him out in New York, and we got, we already had Wecht on board, and we already had, Baden on board, and we paid them ungodly sums and became friendly with them. They're real, you know, I got along great with those guys. They're good guys. You know. Particularly when you're paying them a lot of money, they're real good to you, too, right? But, but they were able to, you know, say, we, this is a good case. We've now got that credibility, and now the guy's on. So now he's doing the analysis, and he's finding out that there's ketones or there's not ketones, whatever the analysis was, that there couldn't possibly be hunger or dehydration if ketones are not present. And you, the only way you could find this is through some new complex convoluted type of called spectroanalysis. Light gets passed through and it, you, you, you analyze the spectrum. And so we got him and we get hit the paper signed off by him. You know, what, is she, what medical examiner does she really listen to? Well, this guy named Davis who's a retired guy from Dade County back in the, okay, you know, I mean, we wish, we, we just, no, no, no money was spared. Um, and so he really helped to put this presentation together so that it would impinge in the greatest possible way. And by the end of it, you know, he was sort of, in a way, kind of working for Dave. I mean, he was like, the way they were talking, like, you know, you know, you don't understand. I mean, Jones a little bit, you know. I know, but you gotta tell, you know, but Dave said, no, but you gotta make her fear, because we will sue we'll sue her. You gotta make her believe we're gonna sue her right back to the Stone Ages, you know, boop ba doop ba doop ba doo. So Mark, here's the here's the the smoking gun, which will never which will never be found. <laughs> she agrees she's gonna change it. I mean, but it's, it's down to negotiating over, Dave's talking to him about, um, you know, are you going to put the car accident in there? She's not going to buy into the car accident's the cause. But, you know, and this is going back and forth for weeks and weeks. And weeks. Think, but Jeff reports that he can, he, he, he's got her to agree that she can put it in there in a contributing circumstance because it's not really a cause. And so that you can make it look like that, but it's not going to, Okay, I mean that's how that's how sort of on our side he was. But he's he, but he's her attorney. She agrees she's going to do it, but she wants a release in exchange. 
That's the smoking gun. And Dave Miscavige had to sign it himself, I'm pretty sure. He certainly delivered it himself. Um, but there was a release delivered to her, and only then did she change, make the change on the, uh, on the uh, death certificate. And that was locked in a safe in Jeff Goodis's office, Goodis and Thompson, or Thompson and Goodis in St. Petersburg. And the only people on planet Earth that know about it are the late Joan Wood, Jeffrey Goodis, Dave Miscavige, me, and Leif Hugate knows about it, but I don't think he's ever seen it. I think the only three living people that saw it was me, Miscavige, and Goodis. And Goodis has it. Or had it, and maybe he destroyed it since she died now. I don't know. Anyway, that's the back story. Um, I mean, she, it was down to him reporting to us about how she's feeling uncomfortable with Doug Crow. And she's afraid of Doug Crow. And now she's almost, and he's sort of leaning her into becoming our ally. 